Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. And today we're dealing with the continuing story of the evolution of health care delivery here in our area. We began with talks about the, some of the early physicians who arrived here with the British and the Spanish, the creation of the early maritime hospital, uh, the problems that were held were, were faced here with, uh, with the fevers all through these, these eras, the primitive efforts at maritime hospitals, and then the first uh, efforts by private physicians to create small 10 or 15 bed hospitals late in the 19th century. And last, when we left off in our first episode, we had, we had finished with the creation here of a, a hospital by Drs. Renshaw and Anderson with, doc, with the nurse Elizabeth Kroll as their superintendent. And that had worked out beautifully. And at the, as we come to the, to the year 1900, uh, they decided that they needed to enlarge that facility. And they did. Uh, and they went, they made it, this time they made it a, a for-profit stock company. And the principal stockholder and the, uh, the chairman of the board was banker Francis C. Brent. And they really did a fine job. They, they rebuilt the, the structure. They had about, uh, care of, uh, there for about 20 patients. And it was a beautifully arranged affair. And, and at this point, they entered into an unusual contract with both the city and the county. Now, this was a joint arrangement whereby the city and county together would pay a total to the hospital of $375 per year for the use of three beds for medically indigent patients. That seemed like a simple arrangement. The price was right. And for the next few years, everything went, for the first few years, everything went along just fine. Through the, through the years from 1900 up to 1905, that hospital, which was called the St. Ant, uh, Anthony's, was highly successful and most respected. They did well. By this time, we had uh, our, the Pensacola Medical Association had more and more physicians, all of whom were, were improving in, the, in their ability to give care. Well, in, in, the, in the summer of 1905, Pensacola suffered its final episode of yellow fever. This was a bad one. Uh, I cannot give you specific uh, statistics on how many cases there were, but they, they were, people were brought down with us by the hundreds. Well, as this happened, of course, uh, everyone in the, in the uh, caregiving industry, if that's the right term, fraternity, came to work together to work as hard as they could. The, the ice makers worked overtime to be sure there was uh, ice to keep these people comfortable. The physicians were assisted by Dr. Jo uh, Joseph Parker, who was the, the state medical officer, and he came over here to help give an, an overview of what might be done, because by the time about three weeks had passed, they, there were certain pockets in, within the city, geographic pockets that were obviously the, the, the hotbeds of the, of the fever. And so basically what they did was to create a quarantine, literally an armed quarantine around several blocks down on the lower end of the city. And this, this, uh, this uh, uh, quarantine was put in force by both state militia and by members of the Pensacola Police Department. This was something that had not been done here before, at least I don't have any record that it had. Well, things went forward. Uh, from day to day, things were getting worse and worse. The, the l &N Railroad came out with a proclamation that they would run a, uh, once a week, they would run a train, a, a passenger train from here up into the the cooler areas of North Georgia to take anyone who wished to go to, to, to flee from the, uh, the dangers of the epidemic, and quite a number of people did that. Well, things went forward. Uh, things uh, the, Ultimately, uh, the, the hospital, of course, was absolutely packed with patients, many of whom were medically indigent. But finally, with, the, with late October, uh, cool weather came in and the epidemic came to a close. At that point in time, of course, the people were very grateful to all who had served. Uh, Pensacola had had several hundred fatalities, but now things began to settle down. And as they did, the board of directors of St. Anthony's Hospital came together and said, OK, we, we've kept a pretty good record of what our costs are because we've kept we've taken care of scores of people here. And so Mr. Brent, uh, Francis Brent, presented a statement to the county and the, uh, the city of the dollars that uh, they, the hospital was billing them beyond the contract that it was been in, had been enforced for $375 a year. Well, the city fathers and the county commission looked at that and said, well, we're, we're sorry. We, we had a contract and a, con a deal is a deal. That's all you're going to get paid. Well, Mr. Brent went back to the others and they had a discussion. Mr. Brent returned and said, now, uh, that just won't do. We can't do business and survive that way. Here is our statement. Uh, we expected to be paid. 
and the counties and the, the commissioners and the, and the council said, we're sorry. At this point, Mr. Brent said, all right, we will give you until December the 1st. And unless we are paid, we are going to close the hospital. Well, I don't know whether the commissioners and the councilmen thought this was bluff, but whatever it was, they did not act. But Mr. Brent did. And on schedule, the hospital closed. Now, bear in mind, at this point in time, Pensacola's population had now topped 20,000, which means that now while we had still had our physicians here, we had no hospital. Well, of course, the, the medical profession itself was sort of frantic. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Payne and Dr. Ames and several others uh, decided they had to do something. So they went to, uh, to New Orleans and uh, they engaged a man by the name of Fran uh, uh, Clarence Hutchinson. Dr. Hutchinson was a, an MD, but he also had a degree in healthcare administration. And they brought Dr. Hutchinson to Pensacola, and he in turn, with the physicians, opened a new proprietary hospital, which they called the Pensacola Infirmary. Now, I must, must add one, one parenthetical thing here because I don't want to lose her story in the, in the taking here. And that was the, the case of uh, Nurse Elizabeth Kroll. She had been a, a true uh, pioneer in both nursing care and in nursing education here. And with the closing of the hospital, uh, Nurse uh, Kroll elected to leave. She went for a time and worked for the public health department in the state of New York. When World War I came along some years later, she was sent to, uh, to France where she literally helped establish much of the medical care uh, provision for nursing uh, for the armed forces in, the, uh, in, the, in uh, Western France, or in Eastern France. So uh, when, she finally, when she finally returned, she had a long career in public health. And when she died, by interest, she never, she never returned to Pensacola. But by interest, her will, and she had a, a nice little estate, her will sent all that she had collected, all of her estate, and it was given by will to the daughter of one of the two physicians who had brought her here originally, that is Dr. Renshaw. So she, we, we kept our tie with Nurse Kroll, but unfortunately, she was not a part of the story long range. Okay, uh, Dr. Hutchinson arrived. They opened the new infirmary, and it worked, it worked along very nicely. It was downtown. It was a, about, a, again, about a 20-bed facility, and uh, the uh, physicians were willing to invest in it to a point where they were at some of the new equipment that was coming along in radiology and, and laboratory services and about this they were they were doing quite well and then then came 1912 and across the, the, the United States the things were were, were uh, people were getting very concerned about health care delivery because in Europe the, Vienna and, and Berlin and Paris and London were coming forth with all sorts of new uh, new uh, innovations in healthcare new discoveries in everything from surgery to prevention to psychiatry and somehow or other things weren't coming to, to, to pass coming into, into into focus for this in our country and at this point in time the car, the rel relative new Carnegie Foundation in Pittsburgh decided that one of the problems that they had was that we our physician base just wasn't well trained so they engaged a young man a young journalist by the name of Abraham Flexner and Flexner's charge was to go to each so-called medical college that existed in the United States and study it and give the give the foundation a, an evaluation. At this time, there were about 180 such uh, colleges or universities or, or schools that claimed to give a first-class medical degree. Well, Flexner went from one to one. You can imagine, this. he didn't do this overnight. It took a, a great, many, great many months. But finally, early in 1914, the so-called Flexner Report was issued. And it was devastating. It said basically there are only half a dozen places in the United States where a first class medical education is being given. John Hopkins is one, the University of Michigan is one, and he went on to list, as I say, about half a dozen. All of the rest were substandard. Well, this, this sent waves across the, the medical profession and went across, uh, across the, of course, across hospitals and across state legislatures. Because what that report also revealed was that many states, including Florida, did not license medical doctors. In other words, uh, I would have been possible, I could go and, and study medicine with, with Dr. John Doe, spend a year, a year and a half at his elbow, seeing what he did, looking at his books. And at the end of that time, I could go out, hang up my shingle as Dr. Jo Dr. John, and basically uh, I would be accepted. Well, who knows how much damage I might do with that kind of background. And this is, of course, what the public began to say. And as a result of the Flexner report, we began to see changes, first of all, in medical education, and then, of course, 
also in the licensure and practice of medicine. This, this meant that doctors themselves became closer and closer together, much more sharing of information and as all of the, the things that were, were necessary for it. But of course, we reached 1914 that, that as the Flexner Report was released, and Pensacola is still working with this little 20-bed Pensacola infirmary. Dr. Hutchinson was doing a good job, but uh, people realized that the population was growing, and with all this new medical knowledge, all this new equipment that was available, we were falling farther and farther behind. And so, so Dr. H Dr. Uh, uh, Walter C. Payne, Dr. Haynes, and uh, a couple of others went to the Catholic Church and got Dr. F uh, Dr. Uh, excuse me, Father Kennedy, who was the, the ranking parish uh, priest here at this time, got him together with a number of other people, including uh, civic leaders Max Baer. Uh, they, they put together a team and they went to the city council and said, look, the time has come. We have got to do something to provide a first-class hospital here. Now, here's what we suggest. Let us put together a proposal. If the city will provide some property, we will try as a group to raise funds. And that, with that as a, as a background, we will go to the Sisters of Charity in, in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And of course, the Sisters of Charity are already operating a number of first-class hospitals across the country. We will ask them to build a first-class, build and operate a first-class hospital here in Pensacola. Well, the, the people got together. The city indeed did contribute a square block of property on uh, South 12th Avenue. The, uh, the collective, the team members, uh, the, this is before we had any civic club, so this was all done through the Chamber of Commerce and others like that. They put together a fund of slightly more than $10,000. And then a delegation with Dr. Hutchinson, Dr. Payne, and the others went to Emmitsburg. They had talks. And finally, agreement was reached that the Sisters of Charity would indeed build a hospital here. And so beginning early in, uh, late in 1914, early 15, construction of what was first called the Pensacola Hospital went in, into place. Now, of course, we all know that as the, today we talk about that as the old Sacred Heart Hospital on South uh, 12th Avenue. But the building was, was created, it was about 110 bed patient capacity, and the building, a beautiful building, it was built almost like a fortress. Its walls were rock, were stone, they were that so thick, it was a beautiful place that kept its cool in the summertime, and the, the sisters opened the, uh, the hospital on time, and of course, this was done, as this was done, this meant that we were getting a refocusing of all the the, the elements of, that were existent and, and, able, and available to us at that time, and a, a whole new era of me medical care was about to begin here in Pensacola. Well, as that happened, of course, the whole city uh, <clears throat> came forth and, and offered assistance to the, to, the, uh, to the sisters running it. And they said, now, what we are going to need, of course, we're going to get more, because the hospital's here, we're going to get more doctors. And as a result of that, we're going to need, need more uh, nurses for doctor's offices. Would you be willing to start a nursing school? And the sisters agreed that they would. And so within the next year or so, the, the, the nursing academy or nursing school for Sacred Heart Hospital came into being. And of course, it would serve us here in Pensacola up until the middle of the 1960s. They did an absolutely wonderful job. Well, here we are. We, we, reached, the, we reached the year 1920. We now have a, a medical community of about 35 uh, practicing men and women, all who are now licensed by the state and certified in that way. We, we have a first-class hospital, and we have all kinds of new things that are beginning to focus here because of, of the, the innovations of that time, because by now we're beginning to see people begin to take a, a much uh, more careful look at diet, uh, exercise, and all of the things that, that generate good health. We have a, a wonderful array of physicians. They are doing a good job. And the, the, the growing number of the large businesses here are beginning to say, we need to, talk, to focus on health and the care of our employees as well. And so as we move into the 1920s, we are moving a step by step by step into a new era of health care. And that was basically the way things stood when we came to the era of the Great Depression.